Well, that was quite a video. Very well done, wasn't it? I've watched it several times trying to figure out what I might add to the discussion. As a technologist, I've always been totally fascinated with AI. That's why I decided to do this program. But as a parent and as a grandfather, I've come to have some fears about how AI could impact my daughters and my grandchildren's future. And that's also why I decided to do this program. I'll be sharing information I hope you'll find fascinating. And I won't consider this afternoon a success if I don't stoke at least, at least a little bit of fear in every one of you. For many people, robots have come to symbolize the future and to symbolize artificial intelligence, often in scary, discomforting kinds of ways. Creating fears about the future world of work and about future job losses, and for good reason. According to a 2018 study done by PricewaterhouseCoopers, 38% of all American jobs could be lost to robotics and artificial intelligence by the early 2030s. Now, on the other hand, AI is revolutionizing medicine to our great benefit. So the question I want us to consider this afternoon is, Will this evolving technology become a public good or an existential threat? To help us answer the question, we'll look at a select history of AI, the three things that make an AI system go, computer processing, data, algorithms, understanding AI, a hopefully fascinating and hopefully not too technical description of how AI works, technological revolutions and rebellions, the possibilities and dangers of AI technology. And I'll close by making a case for government regulation of AI and data. Well, let's get started. Our select history of AI begins with Alan Turing. Now, most of us know something of the World War II story about how the British computer scientists led the effort to crack the Germans Enigma code. Turing and his teammates created the bomb machine that was used to decipher Enigma's messages. And this laid a foundation for the actual idea of machine learning. In 1950, he proposed the Turing test, a machine that could converse with humans without the humans knowing it was a machine would win what Turing called the imitation game and therefore could be said to be intelligent. American mathematician and computer scientist, John McCarthy is often recognized as one of the founding fathers of AI. He coined the term artificial intelligence in a paper back in 1956 that he presented at an important conference. After that conference, a new scientific field was born and AI research centers began springing up all across the country. In 1966, the US government launched an AI initiative to translate Russian during the Cold War. This was important because it brought more money into the AI research community. Throughout the 1960s, computer scientists focused on machine vision learning and robots. This work culminated in 1972 with Japan building the first full-scale humanoid robot named Wabat-1. But even with heightened interest and good levels of public and private funding, computer scientists found it incredibly difficult to try and create intelligence in machines. The government and corporations began to lose faith in AI. And in the mid 1970s, the first AI winter began as all funding for AI research dried up. Around 1980, there was a thaw in the funding freeze and new expert systems appeared. But after some initial success, the limitations of these systems became apparent and a second AI winter set in. By the mid 1990s, funding and research renewed again as governments, corporations and 
even the general public became interested in AI. Many of you can probably remember watching the contest A Man versus Machine back in 1997, when IBM's Deep Blue AI program took on the reigning world chess champion, Gary Kasparov, and beat him. And then the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s, and AI development slowed a bit, but only briefly, because machine learning was just beginning to work a little bit better. Then in the early 2010s, everything started to come together. It takes three things to make an AI system go. Computer processing, data, and algorithms. So what happened after 2010? Well, first of all, computers got a lot faster and more powerful. From 1975 until just recently, computer processing speeds have doubled about every three years while relative costs have fallen. I got my first computer for Christmas back in 1989. It was a $900 personal computer powered by a single processing chip. This is a picture of my current cell phone. It's a couple years old, it cost me around $600. It has eight processing cores, each one of those exponentially more powerful than my first computer. And there's also one additional specialized processor just to speed up the graphics. Today, the world's fastest supercomputer resides in Japan. It occupies a space about the size of two basketball courts. This is one computer you're looking at. It has over 7 million processing cores and it can execute over 715 trillion instructions per second. Supercomputers are used for tough computationally intensive tasks such as molecular modeling, um, predicting hurricanes, um, testing nuclear weapons, even mapping um, pandemic outbreaks. The second data, the second breakthrough came with data. For our purposes, we'll define data as facts or figures or information that's stored in or used by a computer. Now, that's a gross oversimplification because there is a difference between data and information. Data is unrefined facts and figures and information is the output of process data. But all that's for another day. Let's keep this as simple as we can. So some examples would be text records, images, audio, mobile data. Let's just say anything you see on the internet or anything stored in or used by a computer. And you should know that everything you do with any internet connected device creates data. And in the case of your smartphone, just carrying it around in your pocket or your purse creates data. Here's the report from Google showing everywhere my cell phone went during the month of September. Now, these are not calls I made. This is just tracking information showing where I went. That's data. But back to why AI wasn't working too well before the 2010s. As you heard in the video, data is the fuel that drives AI. And as I've just claimed before 2010, there simply wasn't enough of it. Now that's pretty striking. Let's think about that a second. The uh, first iPhone came out in 2007. Uh, Facebook really didn't take off until about a year later when it started to really grow. Back in 2013, uh, someone at IBM famously observed that 90% of all of the data in existence at that time had been created in the prior two years. But the biggest reason for the scarcity of data was the cost. Historically, 
data storage was very, very expensive, even though the costs were falling year after year. The first one gigabyte hard drive was created by IBM in 1980. It was the size of a refrigerator. It weighed 550 pounds and it cost $40,000. Now to give you some idea of what can be stored in one gigabyte, a full length feature movie today takes up about two gigabytes of data. Here's a picture of the flash drive I used to store a backup copy of this presentation. It cost $8.99 with free delivery from Amazon. And it holds 32 gig gigabytes of data. Today, data storage costs are negligible. And our third thing is algorithms. Now, most of us are somewhat comfortable with the idea of computer processors and data, but algorithms might be a little less familiar. An algorithm is simply a process or a set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations. If you think about an algorithm in the most general way, let's forget about computers for a second. Algorithms are everywhere. A recipe to make a chicken pot pie is an algorithm. Um, the routine you go through in the morning to make a pot of coffee is an algorithm. The methods you use to for addition and subtraction and in balancing your checkbook are all algorithms. In mathematics and computer science, an algorithm is a finite sequence of well-defined computer implementable instructions, typically to solve a class of problems or to perform a computation. Now for a computer to read and act upon the instructions in an algorithm, the algorithm has to be translated into a language the computer can understand. This process is called coding or more commonly programming. And there are many different kinds of programming language. Here's a very simple bit of code from an instruction book for learning a language called Python. And finally, a program is an algorithm or a collection of algorithms that has been coded into something that can be run by a machine. So that's it, algorithm coding program. So with these basics behind us, we're ready to talk about AI. There was a definition of AI provided in the video. Here's a simpler one, a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. Machine learning is a special type of AI that's been around for a long time, going back to the 1980s. But since the early 2010s, it's been all about deep learning because of more powerful computers and abundant data, and because of a revolutionary breakthrough in the way we train machines. Deep learning is used in all sorts of fields, in transportation like self-driving cars, in healthcare to read medical and images like x-rays and MRI scans, in facial recognition systems, and on and on. The diagram with the three nested circles you see here is pretty common, but I'd like to add a fourth circle for neural networks. A neural network is basically a structured set of algorithms that allow a computer to learn from data. Now, its approach is similar to a human brain, which works by recognizing patterns. And that's not a coincidence as computer science has its roots in neuroscience. The Spanish scientist Santiago Ramon y Cajal specialized in neuroanatomy back in the late 1800s. He documented his study of the microscopic structure of the human brain with hundreds of drawings, including many famous illustrations that are still used in education today. He received the Nobel Prize in 1906 for establishing the neuron or nerve cell as the basic unit of nervous structure. But we're talking about him here today 
because his work and his drawings provide inspiration to early computer scientists. The tree-like brain structures he identified are especially notable. In 1958, a research scientist named Frank Rosenblatt unveiled a remarkable invention, the perceptron. This was the very first neural network. Now it's not hard to imagine how this neurobiologist drew upon his background in designing his invention. So here's a diagram of the simple neural network. I think you can see a logical progression here. The idea behind the neural network is to simulate the human brain with its densely interconnected brain cells and to recreate that inside a computer with hardware and software so you can get the computer to recognize patterns and learn things and even make decisions. Now, to be clear, the lines here are not wires. This is software, algorithms, and math. Now, at this point, I know you're either really interested in how this might actually work, or you're scared to death I'm actually going to explain it to you. Just hang in there. We're almost through the technical stuff. I'll point out just a couple of things. On the left is a diagram of the 1980s neural network. You'll recall I said these worked kind of well at first, but their limitations quickly became evident. On the right is a diagram of a modern neural network. It works amazingly well. It looks similar, just stretched out in the middle with more of those green colored things called hidden layers. This works because today's computers are powerful enough to handle the additional complexity of the additional layers and because they're able to crunch the tons of data that the computer needs to see in order to learn. Here's the simplest explanation I can offer in just 30 seconds. The system is fed pictures, thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of pictures as inputs. It identifies edges and combinations of edges, and that leads to identification of features, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. It evaluates the combination of features and produces an output, voila. The picture either is or is not George Washington. Now, in a more useful example, imagine if we feed it hundreds of thousands of pictures of cancerous and non-cancerous cells. It will learn to tell the difference. And this brings us to our one last slide to complete our understanding of AI. This slide illustrates the main difference between machine learning and deep learning and it tells us why deep learning is such an incredible advancement. AI systems have to be trained. And that's done by providing learning examples and by providing feedback. And here's the big difference. In machine learning, a human being has to abstract the raw data before the layers can use it. A human expert has to identify the key features, the eyes, the ears, the noses, and the mouths, in deep learning, all we have to do is label the photographic inputs, George Washington or not George Washington, and the system does the rest. It will learn what his features look like and thus be able to identify him. This is the real breakthrough, how we train the machines. So what's coming in the future? Looking at the types of artificial intelligence can help us understand what AI might have in store for us. Today, we are in the era of narrow AI, also called weak AI. The term is used because artificial intelligence systems today are explicitly created to accomplish a single task. Over time, we'll move into the era of broad AI where systems will be able to, multi to execute multiple tasks and will begin to exhibit a stronger intelligence. Such systems will become ubiquitous along the road to general AI, which is also called AGI, 
artificial general intelligence. Here we're talking about AI that can think and function just as humans do. That's referred to as strong AI. Now, general AI is a far off reality sometime in the distant future. Still today, we're already seeing revolutionary changes in our society because of narrow AI applications. The AI revolution will potentially touch every aspect of our lives in all kinds of ways. And this technological revolution will eclipse what we saw in the industrial revolution with the advent of railroads, the steam engine and mechanical production. And in the second industrial revolution in the late 19th and early 20th century, spurred by electricity, the assembly line and mass production techniques. And in the third industrial revolution begun in the 1960s with semiconductors, mainframe computers, PCs and the internet. Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum is called the AI revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is not only about smart and connected machines and systems, its scope is much wider. Occurring simultaneously are waves of future breakthroughs in areas ranging from gene sequencing to nanotechnology, from renewables to quantum computing. It is the fusing of these technologies and their interaction across the physical, digital, and biological domains that make the fourth industrial revolution fundamentally different from previous revolutions. In this revolution, Emerging technologies and broad-based innovation are diffusing much faster and more widely than in previous ones. And while we're thinking of all the good things that have come out of past industrial revolutions, it's important to note that throughout history, technological revolutions have stirred rebellions. One fascinating example of this is a story about a group of workers in Great Britain, who became known as the Luddites. Picture this. The year is 1811. Great Britain has been in a series of wars with Napoleon that has taken a hard toll on its economy and its people. Amid this, a group of artisan textile workers with work from home jobs are confronted with a new technology that threatens their livelihood and promises to lower their wages. The technology was mechanized looms, one of the inventions of the Industrial Revolution. Now the artisans began to organize and demonstrate under a mythical leader named Ned Luddite. At first their grievances weren't with the looms themselves. They were enraged at the business owners who hired low paid unskilled workers to run the machines that turned out what they considered to be very shoddy products. But the, the protests soon turned violent with most of the violence directed toward the machines. Looms were destroyed and some factories that housed the looms were torched. The factory owners fought back offering rewards, but the movement continued to grow and spread across a swath of central England. It's estimated that machines worth the equivalent of $2 million today were destroyed. Now the British Parliament could no longer sit by and passed a law imposing the death penalty for the destruction of the machines. London had to send 14,000 soldiers to the countryside to restore order. Several Luddites were killed, many were jailed, others were shipped off to Australia and 24 including one child, were hanged publicly. And the uprising was quelled by the end of 1814. But their name lives on. Today, the term Luddite is used to describe someone who futilely fights against technology, a person who is opposed to new technology or opposed to new ways of working. Of course, we see protests today and Undoubtedly, there'll be lots more protests in the future. 
Who knows what forms those proteins may take? And this brings us to possibilities and dangers. AI has, AI has tremendous potential to be a public good across a broad domain of the social domains, health and hunger, education, the environment, security and justice, scientific discovery, just to name a few. Let's look at an example from the field of medicine. Deep learning is being used in cervical cancer screenings. The numbers in each of the squares on the right are percentages of the likelihood that the cells are cancerous. These numbers are generated by AI reading the slide. Now, I could show you a dozen more examples, but I wanna spend our limited time looking at the other side of AI. I'll stipulate there'll be all kinds of truly amazing innovations that will make our lives better. But if this is to happen, we must be aware of the potential risk that we're going to need to mitigate in order to ensure that bright future. There are a lot of very smart, technologically savvy people who are voicing this concern. These people are clearly trying to get our attention. And they're telling us that we need to be thinking about the major risk of AI now, while it's being developed and advancing. So let's take a closer look at what's bothering these people. I've listed six dangers or risk of advanced AI. The singularity, job losses, algorithmic bias, government, political and social abuses, malicious use of AI, autonomous weapons, and a global arms race. Let's start with the big one, the one that gets the most dramatic headlines, the singularity. When you see spooky looking cyber graphics like this one, that's a nod to the idea of the singularity. If you're a science fiction fan, you've probably heard the term used to describe a futuristic world of tomorrow, sometimes a utopia, excuse me, and sometimes a dystopia. The concept of the singularity describes a future point in time when super intelligent machines have reached the level of artificial intelligence with the brain power that surpasses the brain power of all of humankind. Now, at that point, the technology will advance in ways we cannot foresee or control. Unimaginable innovations will transform our society. And all the while, this AI superintelligence will continue to evolve and further advance itself. And here comes the fear. The machines will leave us biological beings behind. Or machines and humans will merge in some fashion. Now, as scary as that sounds, for many, the ultimate concern is just the idea of the loss of control over what we will have created. You see the year 2045 on this Time magazine cover. That comes from a New York Times bestseller by Ray Kurzweil. Now, nobody really knows when or even if this might ever happen, but 2045 is often cited, probably because nobody has put forth more convincing arguments than Kurzweil. Now, the idea of the singularity is, is fascinating to say the least, but do I worry about it? No, I, I really don't. I don't at all. But I am concerned that we are not thinking enough about how to make AI safe. I do worry about these next two risks. A lot of people worry about job losses caused by automation. I think we all understand this danger. So I'll just add that it's not only robotics and automation that's driving this trend. Here's something that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus. More companies have found out that they do not need nearly the number of workers that companies in the past needed in order to grow and achieve scale. Just look at the numbers. 
In mid-2017, Apple was the largest, most valuable business enterprise in the world with a stock market value of $800 billion. It had only 116,000 US-based full-time employees. That's 40 times the evaluation of AT&T in 1962 with only 20% of the AT&T headcount. Compared to General Motors, Apple's valuation was 67 times larger, again, with roughly a fifth of the workers. Companies today, and not just those in the digital economy, simply require less employees to fuel their growth and success. Ill-conceived mathematical models and algorithmic bias. When I went shopping for a new television recently, the salesman told me that if I signed up for a Best Buy credit card, I'd get a couple hundred dollars off the price. So I gave him my social security number. He typed it in the register terminal and in less than 15 seconds, I was approved. That credit decision was made by an artificial intelligence algorithm. Data scientist Kathy O'Neill writes, we live in the age of the algorithm. Increasingly, the decisions that affect our lives, where we go to school, whether we can get a job or a loan, how much we have to pay for health insurance are being made not by humans, but by machines. The mathematical models being used today are unregulated and uncontestable, even when they're wrong. Most troubling, they reinforce discrimination, propping up the lucky and punishing the downtrodden and undermining our democracy in the process. One of the most horrifying examples of how the use of artificial intelligence by government is harming our citizens can be found right here in Michigan. Our state's computerized unemployment system is named MIDAS, Michigan Integrated Data Automated System. It was designed not just to automize the claims process, but also to cut costs by using AI to detect fraud. The free press headline is a story about a man in Zealand the Times story about a man in Traverse City. They are two of 40,000 people across Michigan who were wrongly accused of unemployment insurance fraud between 2013 and 2015. They were wrongly accused by an error-prone AI-based software system that the state allowed to function with little or no government oversight. Now, this MIDAS system has been reined in and the state has offered refunds to everyone who is falsely accused, but that hardly repairs the damage done. These people were fined. They had their federal um, tax refunds seized and many of them ended up having to file for bankruptcy. Michigan is still dealing with lawsuits from this ill-conceived system. And Michigan has another flawed automated system in the Department of Health and Human Services, used to disqualify people with outstanding felony warrants from receiving state food assistance. Between 2012 and 2015, the system produced improper, excuse me, the system improperly disqualified more than 19,000 people from receiving food assistance. A class action lawsuit led to an out of court settlement, and they, they eventually got their benefits, but again, real damage was done. Governmental, political, and social abuses. Here I'm thinking about things like abusive surveillance, pop, uh, population control, privacy invasion, um, AI enhanced propaganda and things like that. There was quite a bit on this in the video. So let's spend our time on a malicious use of AI deep fakes. Now, if you go online and search for CNN deep fakes, 
you'll find a series of short video clips explaining how deep fakes are made and why our government, especially the Pentagon, is so concerned about them. Deep fake technology uses artificial intelligence to make highly convincing fake video and audio. This is, I believe, the most immediate danger face that we face from artificial intelligence. What happens if we can no longer trust our eyes or our ears? For more than a century, audio and video have functioned as a bedrock of truth. Not only have sound and images recorded our history, they've also informed and shaped our perception of reality. Deep fakes are already here and the technology is getting better at what it does, easier to use and more readily available every day. And with the internet and social media, anyone can easily make it and distribute it. Deep fakes threaten individuals, businesses, our society, our national security, and even our very democracy. Some examples, creating fake pornography to inflict emotional or reputational damage on someone, done by an outraged partner or even by a government. An Indian journalist wrote an extremely critical article about her country's ruling party. And the response was a pornographic deep fake video made public. Deep fakes have been used to impersonate business leaders to facilitate fraud. Last year, an executive of a UK based energy firm received a telephone call from his boss instructing him to wire $243,000 to a Hungarian supplier. You know how this story ends. Soon afterwards, they figured out that AI software had been used to impersonate the boss's voice. I think you can also easily imagine how deep fakes audio and visuals and videos could pose unique labor and unemployment risk. A deep fake of a business leader engaged in inappropriate behavior could be used to substantiate a harassment complaint or to blow up a potential merger or to move markets. And then, and then we, and dare we even think about a deep fake impacting an election? The thing is, even if the fake can be exposed and proven false, the damage is done and may be irreparable. Two concepts help us understand how difficult it is to fight deep fakes. The oxygen theory, which argues that by debunking a falsehood, you give the claim a longer life. Journalists struggle with this all the time when trying to decide how much coverage to give a story. And the liar's dividend. This suggests that in addition to fueling the flames of the falsehood, Debunking efforts actually legitimize the debate over the truth. The debunking makes it harder for the public to trust any information on that particular subject. And in the end, there are at least some people who think there still might be something true about the claim. That's the dividend paid to the perpetrator of the lie. The best example, Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. After all the debunking in the world by all sorts of legitimate news sources, and even the evidence of a copy of his Hawaiian birth certificate, a large number of people, something like 20 to 25%, still think it's possible that Obama was born overseas. And that brings us to autonomous weapons and a global AI arms race. This is from the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence. The 2015 gathering of the top AI and robotic minds in the world yielded the following. The key question for humanity today is whether to start a global AI arms race or to prevent it from starting. If any major military power pushes ahead with AI weapons development, a global arms race is virtually inevitable, and the endpoint of this technological trajectory is obvious. Autonomous weapons will become the Kalashnikovs of tomorrow. 
unlike nuclear weapons, they will require no costly or hard to find obtain raw materials. They will become ubiquitous and cheap for all significant military powers to mass produce. It will only be a matter of time until they appear on the black market in the hands of terrorists and dictators wishing to better control their populace. They went on and concluded, we therefore believe that a military AI arms race would definitely not be beneficial for humanity. 30,000 AI and robotics researchers, along with others endorsers, including Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Steve Wozniak, signed this as an open letter to the leaders of the world. And finally, I'd like to wrap this up by sharing some thoughts about the need for some sort of regulation of AI and data. From one of the most interesting, totally fascinating books that I've read in a very, very long time. New technology ripping up and reshaping the economy in individual lives. Personal privacy sacrifice. Local businesses chased out of business by remote technology wielding companies. Monopolies ascended. This may sound like a description of today, but it's also a portrait of America about 150 years ago. We proceed at our own peril if we don't understand the similarity of circumstances and solutions between today and that history. In his book, Tom Wheeler is talking about the internet today, but we can easily apply the same thought to artificial intelligence. The 150 years ago technology he's referring to is the steam railroad. If you were at Great Decisions last year, you may remember this slide. The railroad revolution caused a technology-based geopolitical pivot that altered world economic and military power. And what did Wheeler say? Monopolies ascendant? The monopolistic behavior of the railroads caused all sorts of economic and social upheaval. There was widespread anti-railroad sentiment, especially in rural areas. People believed the railroads were systematically abusing their power, excuse me, with flagrant rate discrimination between similarly situated customers and communities. And the railroad expansion did in fact favor some cities, some industries, and some customers over others. My hometown of Chicago was a perfect example of this. Chicago ended up with more lines of track radiating out in more directions than any other city in North America. That made it a vital distribution hub for transporting grain and livestock from the Midwest to the rest of the continent. This was a monopolistic situation and public dissatisfaction was rampant, especially amongst farmers. The Great Germ Movement led to some laws passed by individual states but it wasn't until 1887 that the federal government finally stepped in. The first economic regulatory agency was established by the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, signed into law by President Grover Cleveland. The act banned discriminatory practices and required shipping rates to be just and reasonable. The public also grew weary protesting the meatpacking industry. Rotten meat was a very common problem. There was a tremendous public outcry and a scandal erupted when it was learned that rotten canned meat was purposely sent to American soldiers fighting in the Spanish-American War. For a period of time, Europeans even banned U.S. meat imports. Congress tried unsuccessfully to solve this problem by passing a number of meat inspection laws. It took Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, published in 1905 with its harsh portrayal of the working conditions and graphic descriptions of the disgusting sights and smells of the unsanitary practices inside the processing plants to stir the country. 
Finally, the Food and Drug Act of 1906 was passed to protect the public from the health hazards of adulterated and mislabeled foods, drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices. So what do we do about AI? As Tom Wheeler has observed, our history is clear. In a time of technological change, it is the innovators who make the rules. So I have to ask, is that okay with all of us? So far, our congressional representatives have been unwilling to do anything to constrain or regulate big tech. Do any of you have privacy concerns? Worry about the effect of social media on your grandchildren? Who is going to make the rules for the digital age for the development of artificial intelligence? Rob Tay's writing in Forbes reminds us, the primary way the government enacts public policy is not by passing a law or the president issuing an executive order or a judge making a ruling in a court case. It's federal agencies like the FDA, SEC or the EPA implementing rules and regulations. And there are good reasons for this. Federal agencies are staffed by thousands of policymakers and subject matter experts who focus full time on the fields they're tasked with regulating. As we have seen time after time in their so-called hearings, when they've tried to confront the leaders of big tech, our congressional representatives have demonstrated they simply are not AI subject matters, experts. Imagine if every time a pharmaceutical company sought government approval for a new drug, Congress would have to familiarize itself with all the relevant technical details and then pass a law on the topic. Government would grind to a halt. AI is a deeply technical and rapidly evolving field. It demands a specialized, technocratic, detail-oriented regulatory approach. Congress cannot and should not be expected to respond directly with legislation whenever government action is called for. Like the industrial barons of the 19th and 20th centuries, the information barons of today seek to monopolize their assets. This time, however, the monopoly has far more reaching effects. In my opinion, this doesn't seem like the fight we want to have. We'd be better represented by a new government agency staffed with computer scientists, along with social scientists and multidisciplinary experts from fields such as the law, ethics, and economics. Sadly, hyperpartisan politics probably make any meaningful action unlikely anytime soon, which is one of my greatest fears because what we do or don't do right now has everything to do with how we ultimately answer the question, will this evolving technology become a public good or an existential threat? Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. That was uh, very compelling talk and leaves us with a very compelling question. Um, let me go ahead and go over the comments and the questions that were in the chat. Now, some of them you may have covered already, um, depending on when they came into the chat. But once it, um, Brad said that several times that the data is the fuel of AI, that is true of machine learning and machine learning is indeed a big driver of AI but there are other parts of AI that do not employ machine learning. So it's more of a comment than a question. Do you wanna, um, do you wanna comment on that? Sure. Um, let's consider first of all, that we even tried to undertake the task of explaining what AI is and how any of this would work to our group. Um, I had to simplify things tremendously so that we could just get some understanding of some of the basics. 
So yeah, I would grant that there's certainly more to that than what I, what I showed you, but I think it gives you a flavor of how this works. Okay, um, there's a considerable debate about whether AGI is even possible um, and the definition is not precise. That is a comment um, that I'm assuming he's looking for a reaction on. And then a, another comment that your slides were beautiful. Yeah, thank you. As, as far as um, AGI being possible, absolutely. There's a lot of people that think that will never happen, but there are a lot of very smart people who do think it's possible. I, I would just say this, you know, I, even though I've studied this and I did this for a living for a long time, I, I've always marveled at some of the things that have happened along the way. And even though I understand a lot of the technology, it's really hard to get your, to wrap your mind around it. Let's picture like a, a computer processing chip in the year 2004. It's about the size of a cracker, a tiny little thing. On that chip, there were 125 million transistors placed in an object that small. I mean, the technology is so amazing that through the miniaturization of transistors, year after year, these things got more and more powerful because more could be put in the same space. I look back at that chip and I think that, that if that's possible, you know, Lord knows what might be possible in the future. Thank you. Um, Professor Bright, you presented as an example of great public benefit, the ability of AI to identify cervical cancer cells, but a human pathologist can do this at least as accurately. So this advance in AI is not an advance towards social benefit. This is labor saving capacity, which seems to be confused with social benefit. What am I missing? Okay, well, I think I understand what you might be might be referring to. I, I chose that example because um, I have a good friend who used to do that for a living. She's now retired and living in Florida. And I remember distinctly every single year, she would have to undergo an examination to, to be recertified so she could do the screenings for another year. And she worried about that a lot. Um, so she, you know, not only had to demonstrate a confidence in terms of being accurate, but because she worked for a profit making organization, every year she was expected to be able to read more and more slides still accurately. Now, in her case, yes, I agree that that AI would um, result in labor savings. But the other thing it does is by if she's working with the AI system, we assume she could be more accurate. And if she is more accurate, the benefit to society would be that there would be less, less formal, uh, excuse me, less false positives. So the society would benefit from getting more accurate reading of that. Thank you. Um... There were a couple of comments. There was a slide that I think that there, there may have been a typo which caused a tiny bit of confusion between the year 2107, 2007 or 2017. And I don't know if it really, we should take the time to go back on that, but there was a little confusion on one of the slides. Um, let me go to the next comment question. You argue for a government regulator staffed by experts, fine, but the agencies you cited were all implementing policies that were legislated. How can Congress learn enough to craft the policies? Well, that's a tough one. The, the two examples I cited were created by legislation, but then of course the legislation created the agency. The agencies became staffed by experts and on and on. Um, that's a tough question. As far as how they would do it, they would need a lot of help. And they would need a lot of help from the very people that they would be trying to, um, to, to regulate. The thing is though, I, I just don't think we can let this go on as it has. The, there's, there's a movie 
on Netflix currently called The Social Dilemma. And it's about social media. Now, if you watch it, I'll admit it's a little bit hyped up, but it will absolutely terrify you as to what, what goes on with all um, behind the scenes with social media and searches and so forth. Somehow, we cannot continue to, to let the tech companies just to continue to do what they want to do. The quote I showed you from Elon Musk about the notion that AI was as potentially dangerous as nuclear energy, uh, he talked about that at length at a conference. And he said, you wouldn't just let people go ahead and create their own bombs and so forth. If it's dangerous, it needs to be regulated, regulated and controlled. And I think that's where we're at. I, I brought it up because I know that most of us are, or lots of us don't like the idea of regulation. Uh, and I'm not so sure I totally do either. But in this case, I, I just don't see any other way. I don't see how we can just let this continue without supervision. Thank you. Um, there, here's a comment. Um, I greatly appreciate that you have helped us confront and even look forward to governance of the potential evils of AI. Thank you. Yeah, and I don't, excuse me, I, I don't want to be construed as, as thinking it's totally evil because I, I certainly do not. But I, I thought that the movie, the video, showed a lot of examples of ways it's being used in the world that are so positive and not so positive. And I really thought we'd get more out of this by looking at what some of the pitfalls might be. I mean, I, I started by saying, I thought it was a terrific movie and I did. And I had to watch the movie a long time before I figured out exactly what I might do to help our group kind of fill in some of the cracks and trying to understand this. I'm of a mind that regulation is like, with governmental reg regulation or whatever, is like a parent, when a child is born, they're the regulator. You have to be able to be regulated once you're born because you cannot manage yourself. And, uh, Regulation is has a purpose. So just a comment. Yeah. Well, I, I think the idea of comparing it to like, you know, regulating um, nuclear energy, you know, sort of an atomic uh, energy commission, or what do they call it today? I forget the name of it, but the idea of a, a world body that's somehow involved in establishing ethics for AI would make a lot of sense. We have a, another question in the chat. And we are at a, just about 2.30. So if people do need to leave the class, um, you may do so. But let's stay on for a few more minutes. Can you talk about the relation between AI and the trust that we have in it? For example, my refrigerator tells me to change its filter every six months at $30 a crack. Isn't this just a way to bilk the consumer? Well, is that any different than changing the oil in your car. I mean, you know it should be done every so many miles. Um, I, I, I don't know, I think you could, I, I see that as helpful. I don't see that as trying to raise money. You know, you can choose to ignore it or not ignore it. What what's, makes you crazy is I had a, a Hewlett Packard printer once that took cartridges for black ink and then the three colored inks and the three colored inks ran out, but I didn't care, I had to print something and it was gonna be in black and white. But that machine decided that since I didn't have a yellow cartridge that was full, it wasn't gonna let me, it wasn't gonna work. Now that's intelligence I would not like to deal with. But had it told me a month earlier, hey, you ought to be looking at the yellow ink, I might've been served, well served by that. Does anybody yeah. else have any questions or comments?
Well, thank you all for listening. Please remember that was my opinion on a lot of this. So I can understand how some of you may feel, feel differently about some of this, but I appreciate your attention. Well, we appreciate you. That was very compelling, very informative. And let's give Brad a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. And have a Go great afternoon. afternoon. Brad, do you want to stay on for a second or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's right. not, not very much to wrap. That was wonderful. Um, all the technology worked. <laughs> Speaking well, I, you know, I, I thought long and hard about even attempting to explain some of that. I mean, the simple concept of what is data. I mean, wow. <laughs> Brad, I think it was really well done, yeah. really well done. And I mean, it was so well orchestrated. And I thought the way you moved through the technical piece was, was wonderful, Those, <laughs> that graphic. And to be able to follow that uh, type of information, I, I thought it was excellent. Thank you. Do you think that people like um, what's this, Zuckerberg thought of all of the things that would happen with his simple thing to hook people up together? Did, he th did you think that he would thought of that when he tried to create Facebook? I mean, of all that could, could ensue well, good, with that production. Point. When Mark Zuckerberg was creating Facebook, he was trying to meet girls. I mean, that's what yep. happened. The Facebook application started <laughs> out as a way to get to meet girls on a college campus. And it just grew and it grew and got popular. And along the way, nothing constrained it. Nothing's constrained it to this very day. Mm -hmm. In fact, Facebook is the home of the most deep fakes probably anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you've got, gotta, to, you've got to let technology begin, but you need to, at some point early on, if, if you recognize any potential for danger, you need to deal with that. Now I can see how Zuckerberg didn't see that at the time, but now we've known it for quite a while that this thing's problematic. Mm -hmm. And he's being investigated about everything on a tap too. He's being held, being responsible for what's going on. He is, he's being called, his company's being called to task. Um, but you know, what they're doing is currently legal. You know, under the, uh, the Communications Decency Act, they are not responsible or liable for the content. The liability in social media right now lies on the people who post the content, not the application or the people that host it. That's what they're fighting about. That's what they're trying to change ultimately. So they do have some responsibility. The old question of do you blame the gun owner or the company that invented the gun and gave him that means, you know, <laughs> back yeah. to the core. Your uh, reference to uh, government regulation, I appreciated that a lot. I know free enterprise and free market mechanisms are clearly the best way to innovate, but without regulation, uh, what, free enterprise is basically a selfish endeavor. Therefore, without regulation and proper enforcement of those regulations, it has the potential to be a negative force rather than a positive one. Well, I mean, there is the profit motive. I mean, that's Absolutely. what companies, going. And that's the primary concern. As a, as a new business, you're just trying to survive in advance. So yeah. Appreciate your comment. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, folks, that'll do it. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Brad. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Brad.